It was around 2012 when people first started whispering about the grand return of the immersive sim, a genre that had been all but extinct for more than a decade. This excitement rose to a fever pitch in 2016 when several high profile immersive sims were released, Hitman, Dishonored 2 and Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Now in late 2017, Deus Ex is once again on indefinite hiatus, the leads of the Dishonored series seem reluctant to return to that world, IO Interactive has been sold off and Irrational, perhaps the undeserving carriers of the System Shock Torch, have been disbanded for good. In this video, I'm going to explain where immersive sims came from, what they're all about and what caused them to never really catch on, despite mass critical acclaim. An immersive sim is predicated on three fairly universal themes. Firstly, systems driven interactive gameplay. Immersive sims typically have highly interactable worlds with every object, character and enemy obeying a universal set of rules that govern the game, and can be manipulated to the player's advantage, just like how I can stack these boxes to get over this wall as opposed to them just being background decoration. Next is a focus on lateral thinking and multiple solutions to every problem. This factor is intrinsically tied to the systemic nature of the game. By manipulating these systems in a variety of ways, you can achieve the same goal using multiple methods, with the systemic consequences of your actions depending on which solution you chose to use. This could be as simple as choosing to deal with a bad guy non-lethally versus killing them. The same aims are accomplished, you no longer have to deal with them, but choosing to spare them is usually more difficult, but it could reward you later in the game. Finally, and this one's a bit controversial, some people think that the immersive sim needs to pay homage to the looking glass design aesthetic upon which the genre can trace its roots, and to understand where all the memes and little nods to prior games come from, we've got to go right back to the beginning, so we can unearth the forgotten game relic that is Ultima 6. The year is 1990, and Warren Spector alongside Richard Garriott are working on the sixth game of the Ultima series. By making the systems in the game more complex, the team accidentally allowed for unintended solutions to puzzles such as using a pet mouse character to squeeze through a hole and into a locked room. This design philosophy intrigued Spectre, but it wasn't until Ultima Underworld in 1992 that the immersive sim as we know it came to be. It was the first RPG to be presented from a first person perspective, and with this change in perspective came the immersive part of the immersive sim. A grounded, physical presence in the game world made constructing realistic systemic puzzles much more intuitive, and for the first time, it allowed NPC characters to have real presence rather than simply being blocks of pixels, greatly increasing a player's sense of their actions having consequence. It was during the development of Underworld that Looking Glass Studios was formed, and the first game to truly show the hallmarks of their design is System Shock. Whilst structurally it's not too different from Ultima Underworld, it introduces two key factors that will come to shape the immersive sim, the setting of the Fallen World and 451. Whilst it might seem like an innocuous detail, the setting of immersive sims is key to their design. The System Shock games take place on ruined space stations, Dishonored and Thief in cities falling to plague, cults and corruption, and Deus Ex takes place in a cyberpunk dystopia. Whilst not full on apocalyptic, these settings all hang in the balance, freed from the typical restraints of human decency and strict law enforcement, but not so far gone that your actions have no consequence. In immersive sims, your choices all mean something, but there's no one to stop you making them. Next is 451 something that would later become 0451. It began life as a reference to the literary classic Fahrenheit 451 and was the code to get into the looking glass offices. In my hours of research I never could work out why exactly this book in particular was referenced, but the legacy of 451 extends far beyond its inspiration. As a small in-joke between developers, it was placed as the first code you encounter in System Shock. This theme continued in the Thief games and into Deus Ex and System Shock 2, this time expanded into 0451 used, for instance, to open this truck in the Unaco base on Liberty Island, the first level. 0451 has since become a calling card of sorts for nearly all immersive sims. You'll see it in System Shock 2, Dishonored, Bioshock, Prey. Almost every immersive sim pays this little bit of respect to Looking Glass's legacy by introducing the 0451 calling card in the opening minutes of the game. With System Shock, all the pieces were finally in play. You were given a series of open plan levels, each containing little individual minutes of gameplay, fueled by the game's physics systems and enemy AI, yet are also totally emergent. An example that Doug Church gives is, you hear the sound of a security camera swiveling, and then the beep of it acquiring you as a target, so you duck behind the crate and then you hear the door open, so you throw a grenade and run out of the way. 
The game's primary antagonist, the insane AI Shodan and the various audio logs you can find throughout the station, serve to give the player a palpable sense of connection to the world without drawing them out of the experience with dialogue trees like were found in the Ultima games. System Shock 1 was, without a doubt, revolutionary, but it didn't sell very well, failing to recoup costs. It wasn't until 1998 that Looking Glass released Thief, The Dark Project, a game unfairly regarded as the red-headed stepchild of immersive sims and a proto-deus ex. It's actually really good and was crucial to refining the combat systems in many subsequent immersive sims. But that's a slightly different topic than I want to cover here, so check out Chris Franklin's video on the 0451 phenomena, where he addresses it better than I ever could. Thief and its sequel sold quite well, but unfortunately not quite well enough to stop their publisher, Ideos, going through a bit of a financial meltdown and shutting the company. This was the big schism that, directly or indirectly, created every other major immersive sim studio. This is gonna get complicated, so bear with me. Okay, so Ultima Underworld was made by Blue Sky Productions, which became Looking Glass when they merged with Learner Research. After Thief 2, Looking Glass went bust, and this is where it gets messy. Most of the Looking Glass guys went to work with Warren Spector in a branch of Ion Storm in Austin he was heading up, or transferred to Irrational Games, with whom they were co-developing System Shock 2. Some others went to join Arcane, Valve, Westwood, Harmonix, and others. Uh, keep an eye out for one of those. Things were mostly okay for a while until Ion Storm lost Harvey Smith to Arcane and Warren Spector to somewhere before folding, the rights to their respective properties defaulting to Ideos. This leaves us in 2007 with Arcane, who with Harvey Smith until we're gonna do Dishonored and Prey, Irrational, who have the rights to System Shock, or maybe they don't, but they're making Bioshock anyway, and finally with Ideos, who will one day do reboots of Deus Ex and Thief. Before we talk about the influence Looking Glass continues to have over immersive sims, let's quickly rewind to System Shock 2 and Deus Ex, the golden children of not just immersive sim fans, but PC gamers as a whole. As much as I'd love to gush about the brilliant design in both of these games, a small segment here would not do either game justice, and would spoil the experience for people. So, here's one super awesome moment from each that showcases why these games are great, and also what the immersive sim is capable of. Both of these moments are massive spoilers, but these games are also ancient, so if you've not played them, just go and do that. In Deus Ex, when you meet up with your brother Paul after having uncovered the Unaco conspiracy, a bunch of tough enemies appear and try and kill you both. The game does its best to signal to you that this is the classic part of the story where your mental figure makes his dramatic sacrifice, allowing you to escape and avenge him later. And it can be. However, if you stay behind and fight, it's possible for Paul to survive and continue to help you as the game goes on. Whilst absolutely a well-known twist by now, saving Paul is a fantastic example of how immersive sims encourage and reward solving problems in unconventional ways, and questioning the messages the game presents you with. System Shock 2's best moment is the reveal of the big bad. Through the early levels, you're guided by Janice Polito, who comes to be your only ally in the harsh environments of the Von Braun. When you meet her for the first time and find her dead, well, it's better to see for yourself. The Polito form is dead, insect. Are you afraid? What is it you fear? The end of your trivial existence. When, when, when the history of my glory is written, your species shall only be a footnote to my magnificence. Showdown. Showdown's reveal is hands down one of the most chilling sequences in any video game ever. The sound effects, the visuals, Terry Brosius' fantastic VO, ah, oh, it's so good! As the walls fold away from the cubicle, System Shock 2 tears down your expectations, reminding you that immersive sims require a sceptical eye to see the world for what it truly is. And as Showdown's godlike visage looms over you, it issues a challenge. You are small, weak, and in every conceivable way outmatched. Come get some. Deus Ex sold respectably but not fantastically, selling around 150,000 units in the US, whereas System Shock 2 sold terribly, selling just over a third of that worldwide. As we already know, Ion Storm went bust following the terrible Deus Ex Invisible War and the not fantastic Thief Deadly Shadows, making Deus Ex the last good immersive sim to be produced in just over a decade. 
but why did Invisible War and Deadly Shadows fail? Well, if you ask me, consoles are at least partially to blame. In an attempt to streamline gameplay, storylines were made less complex, expressive mechanics like Thief's Rope Power were removed, and the skill ceiling of these games was lowered substantially. These titles alienated the immersive sim fans looking for a rich, deep experience, and were still too fiddly and slow paced for the average gamer. Let's take a quick aside to talk about some honourable mention not quite immersive sims from the noughties. Uh, right, so I personally don't count these games as immersive sims for a lot of reasons, but strong arguments can be made for their inclusion into the genre based on their design principles. First up is The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. This game does a bunch with stealth, physics manipulation and fairly complex AI behaviours to hit a lot of the same buttons as immersive sims within an open world RPG package. I feel like Oblivion was perfectly placed to scoop up a lot of immersive sim fans looking to scratch that itch. Bioshock. While it's more of a straight up shooter than an immersive sim, Irrational stayed true to the immersive sim aesthetic and story they perfected in System Shock. It's a shame they had to gut nearly all of the immersive sim gameplay to make it palatable for the masses though. There's one more I want to mention, but that is a secret until later. It wasn't until 2011 that Deus Ex Human Revolution came out, followed not long after by Dishonored, and with it, the immersive sim genre was revived. Unlike the games that killed Ion Storm, these games have streamlined the essentials of Deus Ex and Thief respectively while keeping the core themes. Human Revolution gives the cyberpunk moral ambiguity of its predecessor a run for its money, and Dishonored takes the more high adventure feel of Thief, substituting stuff like rope powers for the fantastic blink ability. Both of these games offer your classic immersive sim fare, cool AI interactions, multiple possible playstyles with various degrees of sneakiness, and some systemic stuff to play with. However, fast forward 6 years, and the future of both franchises is looking pretty bleak. Why is this? To understand why, we've got to understand the realities of game development. Artists, voice actors, programmers and designers are all very expensive to employ and immersive sims need a lot of them to sell the illusion of a realistic world and makes immersive sims incredible financial risks for AAA publishers. When you consider the fact that owing to alternate routes and storylines, a large percentage of the content won't even be seen by most players, it turns a risky game release into an all or nothing gamble. For a variety of reasons, most notably rubbish microtransactions and a lame sequel baiting story, Mankind Divided was nowhere near as good as its predecessor, and it sold really quite badly. Square Enix didn't want to take those kinds of risks again, and so can the franchise. Again. Dishonored sequel sold respectably and was a great game, but immersive sims don't just take a financial toll on developers, they're also incredibly time consuming. Every level and every environment must be meticulously planned to be freeform, immersive and appropriately challenging and credit to the Dishonored team for doing just that, but from interviews you can tell that they're really burnt out on it and who can blame them, making regular games is hard enough work as it is. There's one more factor that leads to the instability of immersive sims as a genre and I feel like this one's going to upset some people. That is the fact that despite all of the advances in processing power, games literacy and the gaming canon as a whole, the immersive sim is still inexorably shackled to the spectre of Looking Glass Studios. Nowhere is this more clear than in Prey, the latest game from Arcane. The game's pivotal sci-fi concept is called Looking Glass, it follows all of the System Shock beats and Neuromons are just renamed cyber modules. Prey toes the Looking Glass line so hard that it ends up suffering. There's a bunch of neat stuff like the glue gun and the mimic power that never really go anywhere because the game is too occupied trying to be System Shock 3. Prey is so focused on reminding you of what it wants to be that it forgets to actually do anything. Behind the 2017 Sheen is the same game that immersive sim fans have been playing for 18 years now, and if the genre is going to survive, that needs to change. You're a blank slate protagonist of indeterminate past who quickly gains some sort of versatile setting appropriate suite of powers. You've got to go stealth through a series of collapsing environments, reading audio logs and managing limited supplies before you face off with an omnipresent big bad who probably wants to become god. That's literally all immersive sims have been for far too long. I feel like the two big revival immersive sims, Human Revolution and Dishonored, were a step in the right direction. Not necessarily because they streamlined the model, but because they evolved it, making the genre faster paced and more combat heavy, rather than combat being the clunky chore it was in the older games, breathe new life into immersive sims, which quickly stagnated by the time their sequels came around. Remember when I said some people think immersive sims need to pay homage to Looking Glass? I'm not one of them. Hitman is a fantastic example of the immersive sim that totally eschews the Looking Glass design aesthetic. 
That's because IO Interactive doesn't have any of the Looking Glass DNA. The game's got a collection of systemic open plan levels with a huge number of ways to approach a singular goal, but it goes about this in a totally new way, turning stealth action into a brilliant puzzle box of moving parts that you can tinker with at your leisure, with loads of cool mechanical interactions like the always entertaining disguise mechanic. Apparently about half of all the important people in the world are bold, grumpy looking white guys. Who'd have thought? Now, Hitman was still a huge financial risk just like any other immersive sim, but it is such a breath of fresh air after going through a bunch of them, all of which were beginning to blend into one another. We're at a crossroads in game development. Stay true to the genre's roots with Looking Glass and let stagnation and AAA financial demands drag the genre down once again, or do we put into practice the lessons that these games taught us? To use the tools and knowledge we're given in order to create a new solution to an interesting problem, and in doing so, leave behind Neuromods and 0451s.